Hello there, everybody. I have a question for you. Do you want your prayers answered? Do you really want your prayers answered? Then I have some advice. Stop praying to God. That's right. If you really want your, ans your prayers answered, stop praying to God for what you want. Let's discuss. So, this past week we had the portion of what we call Bishalach, the exodus out of Egypt. We finished the ten plagues in the previous two portions, uh, you know, and it's all about that classic movie, The Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille, if you ever saw it. The whole story of Moses, you know, going to Pharaoh, let my people go, and so on and so forth. With all the theatrics of the plagues, there, there was blood, there was the, you know, staff that turned to a snake, there were frogs, there was uh, locusts, uh, you know, whatever. All the different plagues. The firstborn of all of Egypt died. So, you know, again, not nice necessarily, but apparently necessary in this coded message of the Bible to release the people from slavery. So, okay, we again, let me remind you, we're dealing with secrets. We're not dealing with a literal story ever. If we are discussing the Bible stories according to the Kabbalah and the Zohar, if you understand the stories as only physical stories, you are an idiot. Not my words. Please don't take offense. These are the words of the Zohar. A person who understands these stories as only stories is not thinking right. Because if the Bible is divine, don't you think God could orchestrate better stories? Think about the stories of the Bible. There are stories of incest. There are stories of murder. There are story, I mean, stories that make no sense at all. The righteous people committing what appeared to be, you know, not okay things. You know, Judah, one of Jacob's sons, goes out and finds his uh, former daughter-in-law pretending to be a prostitute and picks her up has a relationship with her, and eventually out of that comes the whole house of David. You know, <laughs> does that make any sense? We have to go to the secret books to understand these things are not stories, but every word, more than that, every letter, is a secret to give us insight into our life. Not then, but today, every generation, today, today, and tomorrow, that will help us improve our life. Why? Because the Creator is only one thing. The light force of the Creator, God, is a sharing force, an endless sharing force that is constantly wanting, desiring to give us beneficence period. There is no negativity in the force of the Creator, none whatsoever. Where does negativity come from? Where does the chaos on the planet come from? Good question. Very good questions. But let's get into the topic for now about this idea of prayer. So religion already, you know, set the plan for us. Organized religion says you need something, you want something, pray to God for that. Does it always work? Okay, perhaps sometimes it does, but I will venture to guess that for most of the population, when they are in need and they pray for something, it doesn't always happen. I mean, check it yourself. If it works for you, that's great. Keep doing what works. But again, for most of the population, it does not appear to work. And if, if it did, probably the world wouldn't look the way it looks. So, where is the origin? And I'm sure there are many origins for this idea of praying to God when you're in trouble, when you're in need. Even an atheist, you say, you know, that expression, there are no atheists in a foxhole. So, <clears throat> meaning, when you're in trouble, what have you got to lose? Pray when you're really in trouble, 
you know, you pray just in case. You know, I call that the just in case people. You know, I don't believe in anything. But just in case, let me pray. Okay, so that'll help. By the way, sometimes it might help. Sometimes a person, yeah, I don't know, needs an awakening of some sort. But again, that's even another discussion. Let's try to stay on topic. So in the portion, uh, actually in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, chapter 14, let me set the stage for you. So if you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, you remember there was a scene where Pharaoh finally, finally decides after his heart being hardened, you know, ten times, nine times, ten times, after the final plague, you know, he's broken, he's a broken man. And he says, okay, get lost, Israelites, go, Moses, take your people, get out. But of course, even after they leave, he has a change of heart. Again, for some reason, it says that God hardens his heart, and they, all of Egypt begins to chase after the Israelites. And so the scene is that the Israelites are up against the sea, the Red Sea, and now the, Isra- the uh, Egyptians are closing in you remember the scene very exciting what do they do they begin to scream Moses 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 you know and some people said well, you brought us out here to die in the desert there were no graves in Egypt and in verse 15 it says that the people cried they cried to Moses and Moses cried out to God Moses cried out to God and this idea of crying out, the word is titzak. In Hebrew, it means literally means screaming, screaming out. It's defined by the commentators as prayer. So Moses screamed out to God. And what was God's answer? God answered the prayer. What was the answer? Verse 15, chapter 14 of Exodus Vayomer Hashem el Moshe, Ma elai. God said to Moses, What are you screaming to me for? Why are you praying to me? Dabe el bene Israel visau. Talk to the Israelites and tell them to go. Go. And yes, of course, it says after that. After that verse, it says, and take up your staff and hit the water and split the water. But there's a, there's a, there's a, a great time in between God saying, tell them to go. Why would God tell them to go? The first thing was tell them to go. And then the second thing was, okay, now take your staff and hit the water and whatever. Even, you know, the Medrash, another one of the more, more, lesser known books to most people, says that the water did not exactly split at that moment. In fact, they were still looking at a sea until one individual whose name was Nachshon Aben Aminadav, son of Aminadav, who was, by the way, the sign of Aries, if you know anything about Aries. They do first, they don't think necessarily. But he jumped in because he believed that the water was split somehow, even though it did not appear to be split. And when he was already up till here with the water, then the water split. So because of his mm, certainty or his faith, he, how shall we say this? He activated the water that was already split on an energetic, on a spiritual level, but he manifested it for the rest of the people. Now this bears out, uh, uh, you know, other teachings that talk about that God already heard and prepared what they needed before they needed it. 
And so it is with everything. It says that before a problem comes about, the solution is already given. You know, the same place where poison ivy grows is another plant that is the cure for poison ivy. Whenever you come upon a problem, you should know that the solution is somewhere in the same vicinity as the problem you have the answer. That's a cosmic rule. Why? And listen to this idea. Only because there's an answer, there's a question. Again, only because there's an answer, there's a question. There's no such thing as a question without the answer. I may not know what the answer is. I may not know what the cure is to, you know, the problem. But don't think that there is not one, because in order for there to be a question, there has to first be an answer. Now that's a spiritual rule. Energy, light always becomes before the vessel. The answer to the need is always there before the need. So there can't be a lack of something if there's not also a fulfillment for it. There can't be an exit unless there's an entrance. Everything is that way. Energetically, plus and minus always travel together. They are separated. They are separated at some point in our journey, in every area. In fact, it says the same thing in the Zohar about soulmates. The male and female portions of a soul, and yes, the soulmates are male and female. I mean, I know some people might be disappointed about that. I'm sorry. But a soul is not male or female. It is male and female. And soulmates come down simultaneously into the world, but they are separated, and they can be separated by time, by years. But they are all part of this. They are part of the same energy. Anyway. So, the answer to any problem is already present. So when I decide that I need something, I need something, we should understand that the solution was already given. So the rule is, and let's understand this, it's a, it's a deep concept, and I, I want us to really be able to internalize this, because you can create miracles if you understand this. You can create great change in your life if you understand this. Because, again, prayer is not necessarily a formal thing. Wishing, oh, I wish this wasn't the way it is and I want it to change. That's a prayer. Okay, that's a prayer. But if that's the way you think, don't, don't you know, hold your breath for waiting for the success to come. Again, I'm not saying it can't. It might. It might. But generally, it's not because of that type of prayer. I'm praying because I need this, I lack, please, God, whatever, whoever, help me, you know, give me this. Help me change this. Wrong. When in chapter 14, verse 15, God answers Moses, Why are you praying to me? Speak to the Israelites and tell them to go. That's the first thing that the Creator in the Bible says to do. Why? Because if they were in the consciousness, they would already have seen their need was already fulfilled before they even asked for it. In other words, they would have come up to the sea, they would have seen already that the sea was open and that they could walk through. Whether this is symbolic or whether this is a spiritual concept really makes no difference because this is what the Kabbalah is telling us, is this is how the system, this is how the process works. And it shows us how to use this understanding, meaning the answer, the solution to any need or problem is already there 
before we ask for it. So what is this idea of prayer? Should we be praying to God? What should we be praying for? So, well, there, obviously there is a concept of prayer, but it's not what we think. It's not what, you know, let's call it the standard of religion teaches, or most people for some reason think that, you know, when you're in need, pray. Why? Because, again, the way the Creator's light operates is a constant force of giving. Imagine you're in the room, in a room, where you have every single conceivable need that you could ever possibly ask for. And you're in this room, and it's filled with everything. Wealth, sustenance of every sort, your, all your perfect perfect relationships in life and uh, all the food that you'll ever need and 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 all the opportunity and all the possibilities everything everything that you will ever need that you will be a perfectly satisfied happy person one problem the room is dark and you can't see anything and so if someone asks you do you have everything you need you'll say well no i have nothing I have only what I can see. Do you have what you can't see? Of course, obviously not. No, if you can't see that you have it, if it's not manifest for you, how can you use it? So you can't. But it doesn't mean it's not there. And so the Kabbalists explain that our relationship with the Creator is the force of the Creator is the endless source of giving and before we even have a need the solution it's there whatever we need money is there health is there it's all there but we do not understand how to receive and because we do not know how to receive we put up blockages rather than create the openings to allow the light that is already present on the energetic level, on the spiritual level, to come in and manifest on the physical level. Think about it for a minute. If you want to plant an apple seed, you want apples, you plant the seed in the ground. And now, who is responsible? What is responsible to, that, to you know, make that seed into a tree, grow, and give fruit. What are you really doing? You had to plant the seed, so you did that. You can take credit for planting the seed. Having the desire, hmm, maybe that's not so much you. But you had the desire, that's part of what we did, and maybe we watered it, nurtured it in whichever way. But if you understand the nature of seeds, you're pretty sure it's going to grow if you took care of it the right way. The process of the seed, once it's in the ground, it's likely going to grow, assuming you nurture it and water it. So what are we really doing? Because everything else is happening naturally. Oh, naturally. What is naturally? <laughs> There's a force of creation that's going to take it through its entire process and create from that seed is going to become a tree and apples and fruit and more new seeds that you can ever dream of. What's my point? My point is everything. Everything is just that way. We have ideas. We have desires. Now I'll tell you now that the desires don't come from us. Our desires also come from our soul, which is linked to the force of creation. It's a link to God. And so we only have desires. Why? Because there's the Creator's light wants to be revealed to us. If you have a real desire to manifest money or sustenance in your life, you're going to plant a seed Whatever that means, you're gonna, uh, 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 you have the idea to get this job or to start this business or to do whatever will bring you that, if you truly desire it. 
Again, if you don't truly desire it, so that's not a real desire. There's a real desire, there's a, you know, fake desire. How much you really want something, that, that's going to push you into action. So let's assume you have a real desire. You're going to act on it. You're going to plant the seed. And then things are going to begin to happen. You nurture it. What is the nurturing? Prayer. Prayer is the nurturing. Prayer is the nurturing that says, I know it's there for me because I have a desire for that. I know you've prepared this for me, creator. I know you've prepared for me a job, a client, uh, whatever. You've prepared perfect health for me. I know it. I have no doubt about it. But, but, I know my job is only to nurture, nurture the seed of my consciousness. Again, the desire I know came from you. If I didn't have that desire, it wouldn't be possible. But since I have the desire, I already know it exists. It's there. Because you already prepared it. And because you prepared it, I have the desire. Again, it's not that we have a desire and then things happen. Things happen first, which is why we have a desire. I know this is a very difficult idea. But again, think about the shoes. You only went to buy the shoes because the shoes, the force, the fulfillment, which is the light of the Creator, in the form of shoes, yes, even God is in the shoes, already created for us a desire to have the shoes. So now we go to the mall, we nurture it. We go to the mall and whatever it is, we do our research to find out where they're selling those shoes and I go buy the shoes. Why did I go buy the shoes? Because the Creator wanted to be revealed to me with those shoes right now. That's how the Creator's light wanted to be revealed. We have to understand the principle that the Creator's light always wants to be revealed for us in whichever way, in whichever fulfillment. And so if we begin to think that way, well, wait a second, I have this real desire for this. Must be the Creator's light wants to be manifest for me now in this. So this already exists which is why I have the desire. All I need to do is nurture it. Now you can pray. Pray to nurture, nurture. Not, oh, I want this. No, don't say you want this. Because when you say you want this, you're saying you don't have it. Don't say you don't have it, because that's not true. You do have it. How do you know you have it? If you have a real desire for it, that means you already have it. On a spiritual level, you do have it. Prayer is for what? To help me do all the things to manifest what you want to give me. Now, I want to manifest what you, Creator, want to give me now. I want to make it physical. I want to manifest it on the physical level. Because that's what you want to give me. You want to give me perfect health every day. So let me pray to nurture the manifestation of that desire that you want to give me every day. You want to give me wealth. You want to give me the perfect relationship with harmony and understanding. I want to nurture that. How do I nurture it? Pray to make it manifest always, but know that you have it. That's the key. If you pray because you think you don't have it and you need it, you are activating your lack. You're saying, God, you don't exist, really, because I don't feel your light. That's much more difficult. That's much more difficult. And as I say, it's not impossible. It's not that you can't make things manifest through that type of prayer. But it's way more difficult because you have to change a nature of some sort. You have to alter something. And there's no altering in the Creator's light. That light never changes. It's constantly giving. But if you say, and again, this is the connection in your consciousness. If you say, I'm not receiving it right now. I'm not receiving it because what? You're not giving it to me. So I need it. I need it because I don't have it. It's a different level. Do you understand? And I hope, it, I hope I'm explaining it 
thoroughly. Uh, and if you have a question about this, uh, please, you know, put, put a question in the, in the comment section in YouTube because it's very important that this be clear for us. This is the way to manifest things in life. Stop praying to God for what you don't have. When you have a desire for it, and I'm talking about a real desire, when you're willing to do what needs to be done to create it, means you're willing to make the effort, that already means you have it already. You just need to nurture the desire in whichever way, physically and again through your prayers, not because you're praying for something you don't have. You're praying to nurture. And I might add, in addition to that, if you want it to be even more powerful, add to that, make it manifest as well for all other people who have difficulty manifesting for themselves. All those people who have sustenance coming to them, who have health coming to them, because the Creator's light goes every, shares with everyone. But again, for whatever reason, one reason or another, which we'll explain likely in the next video, why we, you know, what's the purpose of the lack, the feeling of lack in our life. And it's probably not what you think. But to help other people in your prayers include other people within the framework of that nurturing. Why? There's a verse that says, one who prays on behalf of their friend is answered first. Not that that's an agenda. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that agenda. Pray for your friends. Pray for your family, obviously. And all those in need, all the people in the world who need that that light wants to become manifest. And for whatever reason, those people may not know how to manifest on their own. Help them. Another excellent addition to what we've already spoken about. Be blessed, guys. Remember always, leave a thumbs up in the video if you like it. Uh, leave your comments, please, in the comments section if you have any questions at all about this. And subscribe if you already subscribed. And I'll be looking forward to see you on the next video. Be blessed. All the best.